So I am. I have a, a little bit of a, a like a preamble to read, and then I'll introduce uh, our our guest tonight, Tracy Freeman. But but first of all, I found this uh, short paragraph uh, that talks about um, civics. So. <clears throat> National sentiment and discussion have recently focused on public apathy and civic disengagement. There are many historic causes of civic disengagement. Included among those causes are the historical forces that have disenfranchised certain populations, both formally and informally. African-Americans, women, lower socioeconomic groups, and people with disabilities all face the challenge of gaining equal political empowerment. In addition, civic opportunity gaps are created in regions where inadequate public education and support services are provided for students to develop a civic identity at a young age. When deprived of these opportunities, students matriculate through the pre-K to 12 experience without gaining a sense of agency and competency in civics. These causes can be compounded by political infrastructures that quiet voices of dissent. Examples could include gerrymandering of districts, which result in the silencing of minority political party voice within district boundaries. Another example is the role of big money in the political system, which can tilt the playing field for candidates as they compete for limited resources. All of these factors can contribute to a perception of corruption and or ineptitude of civic leaders. Apathy and civic disengagement can develop as a result. And that is uh, from the State of Maryland Civic Education final report um, <clears throat> from their symposium. So that's just sort of a, a, a baseline of information that is important, I think, to, to know. Um, so I will introduce uh, Tracy Freeman. Tracy is our, our guest tonight. And uh, after 30 years, 30 plus years in the classroom, Tracy retired from McLean County Unit 5 as a department chair at Normal West High School in 2022. As a nationally board certified teacher, she has continued to work in education as an Illinois instructional coach for civics for the Illinois Civics Hub, a supervisor of student teachers for Illinois State University and Illinois Wesleyan University, as well as a virtual mentor for the Illinois Education Association. She proctors online courses for the Guardians of Democracy Credentials course, works the Illinois State University Women's Athletic Bench Crew, and occasionally subs, continuing to stay connected to students and teachers in today's classrooms. So Tracy, welcome, and I will hand it off to you. Thank you. First of all, as a former high school teacher, if you have questions, I'm not sure of the typical format, but um, I'm not sure how this is going to work with the screen sharing and on a Zoom, but please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up or use the chat either way. It's kind of a flashback to my COVID year having to use the technology. So um, definitely want to make this what you want. Um, so I have a lot of slides. I'm happy to share this entire deck with you. Um, when you see the slides, again, part of the civics mandate was that it had to be privately funded. So the McCormick Foundation out of Chicago, Illinois, which is now housed in DuPage County Regional Office of Education, is who is responsible for making sure we have civics coaches all over the state of Illinois. Um, and so most of what I have dove into has been um, working with a woman by the name of Mary Ellen Daniels through the Illinois Civics Hub. Um, she just officially retired this year, but is still doing, I think she was in Hawaii doing civics education. And um, I've worked alongside her with many things. So if you notice things on the bottom of any slide, I'm trying to give credit to the folks and the connections that she's helped me make in my time. I started working with her before retirement and still I'm very involved. So um, if you have an iPhone with you, I'm going to ask you here in a moment um, to do something. 
Uh, does this view bother you with the smaller size? It lets me find my accompanying slides first. I think I did go full screen for that. So when I was preparing for tonight, I took from the press release and I was, you were asked to come if you were curious about what is covered and how it's being taught with that preface of the Annenberg Civics Survey. So I thought I would kind of put it on you for a moment. So if you would take your camera and take a picture of that QR code, it should take you to an online um, surveying tool called Poll Anywhere. As a high school teacher, when I use this in my classroom, I ask for their names. You can put initials or you know just a period, whatever you want to do. And I want to know from you what you think should be taught in a civics classroom. So if you take a picture, it should highlight yellow and poke it to accept their terms. And if you don't want to do that, you don't have to, but this gives me a way to get kind of get a feel for you. I can back up to that slide, but while you're doing that, I kind of just thought again, the teacher and me, that one of the things I wanted to make sure you had from us or from me was what is required from Illinois um, and what shifts in our instruction at the high school level and middle school level had to go along with that. And then obviously answer any questions that you have, that would be the priority and providing a connection to the civics world. Um, and how we got there, this all started, um, I put kind of a red timeline in 2015 with a, a very similar Annenberg type survey coming out and actually a coalition of government teachers. Most of us I know probably took government in class. Um, oh, that's fine. If you don't have an iPhone, Peggy, that's fine. Um, most of us took a government class in high school and that kind of went away. When I first started in McLean County Unit 5, we taught our constitution unit is what is mandated by the state law or was. We did that in our U.S. history class. And so we had continued um, to move on. And then um, you saw in 2015, they said the following school year was going to have to be a separate pull out high school course. Um, my daughter is 27. She was in the graduating class of 2015, so she had no civics at all. And it shows, trust me. Um, then they also, in 2016, said that it, they had new standards come out that were supposed to be revised in 2022. They are not yet revised. In fact, if you go to the web page to look at revisions of what should be taught, they are down. There's nothing. So any new teachers would not have access to what it is they're supposed to be teaching right now. And then in 2019, right before the pandemic, middle school was supposed to start because of all the variations in middle schools, either over the two to three years they're in middle school, they have to equate to a semester of instruction on civics within that time they're in the school. So you know, five schools are three years of middle school, they're supposed to get instruction equivalent to a semester. And then the fourth again is the private public partnership. Um, I'm going to exit out of this and see what you all are thinking. Okay, let's see. Here come all your responses, I hope. So again, this is something I like to teach both my student teachers and my teachers. If it comes, let's see if they're coming in. Did you get an error Wait, message? Tracy, uh, some of us, I think, were stumped by the... Uh... I oh, that's fine. So. Um, it could be. There we go. So we're starting to see some of them come in. Um, I did this with the Illinois State teachers, and I'll share with you a little bit some of theirs. Um, and again, I apologize. I didn't hit that activate button soon enough. But this is something I encourage my uh, student teachers, there we go, to be able to do so that you can see. Now, the larger, as we get more and more responses, if I did this in a classroom of 30, I taught summer school, actually, this summer at Dunlap High School. And here we can see the changing sizes of the font. That means that more than one person has said that. So if only one person says it by the time we're done, it would be smaller. And so you start to get a feel 
of what is supposed to be taught and what what is part of the confusion I think with the Annenberg quiz I'm not I'm not here to deflect from that quiz it's appalling um, I guarantee you I could name people that would do even worse than that quiz um, but it is something that again brings civics to the spotlight which I'm somewhat very grateful for so let me exit out of this um, there we go I can check back here in just a moment to see if more comes in um, but if you look at this again, um, part of what the push was in 2015, again, 2019, was trying to sell people on the need for civics. So this slight handout talks about the increase in, like you mentioned, the civic engagement, but also reading scores and making things relevant. And you can see the pie graph there. It's really small, but the social studies instruction there is a little piece of that pie in the day. I know my own children going through and it, it tended to be the great heroes of elementary school, not so much the civics. So some of the explanation I would think for why, um, but this is what we are supposed to be doing in Illinois. Um, that number four is that direct instruction there. And if you look at that direct instruction, that's some of what the survey certainly hit on that people were not getting to. Um, but what's really interesting to me is questions one, two, and three are more along the lines of how we teach. So again, this direct instruction is what I asked you about on the survey. Here's what the Illinois State students said. And you could see some very common things with the exception of they had morals and philosophy and some of these. And these are people that are about either in their student teaching, if they're a fall student teacher or about to go out and student teach in government and politics as well as history classes. So a lot of commonality, um, but many of them weren't even sure they were certified to teach civics, which was very kind of disturbing to me a little bit there. But if I put these mandates back up, I've highlighted a couple of things. What else do you guys notice? kind of giving you some hint with some highlighting. Four is what Annenberg measured, but what do you see there? Sorry, Linda, I just now saw your message. I got it, it was me. What do you notice? Maybe, let me make that full screen maybe. Real world issues. Yeah. Hey, Anne, I think maybe, um... Tracy is really asking us to participate in her uh, presentation. So maybe it would be helpful if you unmuted us and we could just. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Her presentation at, at yeah. So, I uh, mean, I can talk for 20 minutes. Believe me, if you were all high school teachers, your, your high school students, your screens would be off and I wouldn't hear a word. But I'd rather see where this kind of takes us. So if that's okay with you, Anne. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, so real the, world issues, which right there, if I'm a, a yeah. classroom teacher, that's a filter I'm going to have into what I'm bringing into my classroom, right? One of the things that really I notice is that this is not limited to talking about government. It's no, it's, it civics engagement or civics um, is connected to a whole much broader um, interaction with the. Uh, with our institutions and uh, that kind of thing. And that um, I th that surprised me. Most people focus on the four, right? The direct instruction. And definitely I've got some slides talking about why that in and of itself is a problem because there is no, when you look at Illinois standards, it does not spell out exactly what that means. There's a lot of commonality and overlap, but at the at the same time, there's no national curriculum for sure. Um, which might be a good thing. There's no state bound wording. It's very general. It's key characteristics and, and it's written in that way. It's well, also interactive. Very interactive. Right. And the real, the real world issues could um, be things that we are still dealing with today. Oh, it, those are the high interest ones. That That is for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, sure. we don't need to solve, uh, you know, the Midwest peace. But it'd be nice to understand what the words right. in our constitution mean and how they're interpreted. Right. And and part of parts one, two, and three here are when you're having those discussions and you're building up the capacity for the students to get involved in a service learning project, which is not community service, 
You know, it's not, let's grab a bunch of garbage bags in the school bus and head out. It is something completely different. Um, when I first saw this mandate, I had 150 seniors and juniors, and I thought, how am I supposed to keep track of who does what? And my first question to uh, Mr. Healy at the, he was at McCormick at that time, he now works for iCivics, was, is could, if they did community service for like their National Honor Society, would it count? And he just shook his head and he said, that's what we're fearful is people are going to think this is a community service activity. And it's actually totally different. Um, you can see some overlap and we'll look at that in a minute. And then last but not least, simulations. And this is where I was so pleased that a group like yours with such a great reputation reached out because the simplest of a simulation is to get folks registered to vote and show them the power of elections. And that is something that is an, a separate state mandate now. Um, but it also has such a key uh, role, I think, for, for other groups. So I wanted to take just a minute to look at some of the Annenberg questions here. Um, this was one of the other questions that I found very interesting. They asked 2022, they do this every year. And if you really dive into the research, into the Constitution Day survey, they did it in a different way. They used to just call people and then they used to give some people written surveys. Um, so there is some disparity if you're a real data person in the percentage of respondents, but we're gonna presume that it's it's valid here. So 22 to 23, what do you predict? The I don't people? understand the question. They wanna know, Do they just ask people, do you approve, approve of the US Supreme Court? And it went from approve strongly to disapprove strongly. What prediction do you think we're going to see in one year's time? Is it going to change? Is it going to be about the same? Is it going to be, what would you anticipate? I, I think um, it will drop. The approval rating actually, will drop? I think it will. Does anyone disagree with Anne? Well, so you're asking them the current makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court and their current actions. Do you approve of right. that as opposed right. to the existence or yep. the concept? Okay. hundred percent. And this was one of the questions on that survey. And then they dove into another question that I'll share with you. Um, and I think you're, you're correct there. Sort of. I mean, yeah. if you look at the total percentage, very similar. Mm-hmm. I would have predicted based on the negative stories in the press that it would have seen a lot more of the yellow. I yeah. would have predicted a lot more people. And so using something like this in a classroom, talking to students about media and how media is a snapshot, if they're aware, most of them get their media now from TikTok. Um, but this is the type of thing that Annenberg would ask them. And then you, if we were doing an inquiry into this, we might dive in and say, what does, you know, look at the question, the wording of the question and, and who's asked and what, what might influence that. This is the question where they measured and they said that people did incorrectly. So they asked individuals, and again, I think it was about under 1700 people po were polled, what percentage of the cases that the Supreme Court decided last year were nine zero or eight one? And they let them just type in a number and for their results, they put them in these categories, zero to 20, mm -hmm. 81 to 100, 61 to 80. So again, what percentage of last year's Supreme Court cases were 9-0 or 8-1? Low. low. Very low? <laughs> no. Is that what most no. people think? Uh, no. Yeah. No? No. Why no. not? Why? Because those cases never get the headlines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it was over 60% that that it was 9-zip or 8-1. Well, here's what the, most people thought. About 40% of those surveyed said, uh-uh, very low number. And over half were actually, you're right, Maureen, that most of the ones we hear about, right, the contentious, yeah. the five fours, that's what dominates our media and gets us in there. So. And again, um, they said that it's, yes, there's a split, but over half of them were either 9-0 or 8-1. So very good. You get a star. You get a sticker. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and this is, again, the survey that they went to, some of the things. And I 
that's where my thing was. This is the knowledge breakdown. Only 66% of people knew all three branches. Um, I was asking my husband, he told me he would not answer the first amendment. Uh-huh. This was a breakdown. These are the ones that were making the headlines. Again, 77% of people got rid of speech. Um, and then they went through the other first amendment and then they asked the specific question about the second amendment. That surprised me that more people weren't familiar with the second amendment because that seems to be a stomping point for some political things. Anyway, so what, why did I want to point this out to you is if I were teaching right now, that would be a societal issue discussion. When I taught this summer at Dunlap, I asked them the importance of civics and and had them read a short reading about that. And it, I think it was titled like this, not your parents' government class, because it is so much more about, yes, you need the direct instruction, but the reason that is fourth is it's what you need to understand those first three, how you're teaching these things, how you're getting the students engaged, how you're asking them to be involved in simulations of democratic processes. That's what makes the direct instruction necessary. When I tell my students we're doing a moot court or we're having, um, let me exit this so I can show you. One of the big key topics here is that we have a discussion in that first point. We don't have a debate. And so it's a big difference for students. And we talk about why we're having this dialogue. The goal is to understand both sides of an issue and for you to make up your own mind. And so when we talk to students about that, this is the key point here. We're working together for common understanding, not changing your mind, not this indoctrination you hear about. Um, In my three-week class in Dunlap, and again, I had no connection to Dunlap at all, um, growing up in Peoria and then living in normal, we managed to have some very powerful dialogues ending with our final exam was right after the Supreme Court had argued about the um, assault weapon ban. So we ended up having a dialogue around that and what those arguments would be. And then the students individually would react based on those arguments. Um, We would start obviously with something kind of different and small in Chicago. This is a really big deal, right? You put ketchup on hot dogs or here. (laughs) And the kids laugh, but we learn to listen and we model norms in our classroom. And how do you work this? And the kids laugh at this. And one of the things that we use the most often is something that we call a structured academic controversy, where it's just that it's structured. It's a dialogue around an issue. And so even something as silly as the toilet paper, you know, I said, we, I can say, I understand that you think A is the correct answer. Not sure who raised you, but no, I can't say that. But then we model how to have that dialogue because they don't see that in the real world. They don't see um, all of the dialogue and the civility that they want and the students enjoy it. They worked, we worked all the time in our civics classes and it actually spilled into our other courses to build that and actually providing them with transitions. You know, Maureen, I heard you say most cases ended that way. Maybe they ask a clarifying by most. What number do you mean? Or they have to repeat back facts. And then we agree because media literacy is a huge focus on using items that aren't from the two extremes when we're looking for facts. So street law is a a group that provides a lot of the current like ongoing cases. They just sent out an email yesterday over the Indiana school board members who blocked constituents from their Facebook pages. And so I'm subbing tomorrow. And that's what the civic students I'm subbing with asked, can we sack something? Can we, I mean, they enjoy having dialogue and it's not that don't talk about politics. Don't talk about something controversial. They want to do that. And then as you progress through the semester, you look for ways to let them take informed action. I'm just going to jump to this because I want to give you plenty of time for questions. Um, These are some of the ideas that they could do when we're talking to students about this and we show them something like this. The column on the left, students collect money for a local animal shelter versus how do you look at getting around a FOIA request or conducting a survey about school climate 
students find their real world issue that motivates them. And we spend quite a bit of time on it using a root cause tree. So something I thought you all might appreciate is voter apathy. So we don't talk about the symptoms of low voter turnout. We focus on those causes. You mentioned, Anne, many things in that introductory paragraph about why somebody might not vote. So students might look at voter apathy within their own teenage group. I loved our, our retired state senator, Jason Berkman, was awesome at coming in and talking to our students. And he would tell all of our students, um, I don't have to listen to you because you people don't vote. And they would, their heads would explode. They'd be yelling and screaming. He's like, I'm sorry, but you don't call my office. You don't write me letters. And most importantly, you don't vote. If you want my attention, you have to show me that you're engaged in this process at a minimum. So we talk about that and we talk about the causes of voter apathy and why people don't turn out to vote. And a lot of them talk about the fact that it's politics seems contentious in their house. They don't want to talk. They don't want to bring these things up. And that's something we try to overcome with our dialogues. And, and I know it's not an official survey, but of all the activities we did, I, it was a three week class, four hours a day, hands down, the students said they appreciated having a dialogue with people around topics that were, that they could understand. But this is what our students do. And then they focus on a cause here. So students at, at Normal West focus on something as simple as we want to recycle the, the Doritos bags in the cafeteria to somebody had the town planner in trying to get a stoplight in front of the high school. Um, and the best was she didn't tell the principal she had booked the conference room and the town planner walked in and he, she said, this doesn't concern you. This is a town sheet. And I was like, oh, I'm glad I'm tenured. So, um, but we show them things like the five whys. And this is a great little video that talks about why the, the birds were uh, pooping all over Thomas Jefferson. And they figure out very quickly that it had to do with the type of light bulb being used. And if they switch light bulbs, it could save themselves millions of dollars. So, but that's what we try to get them to look at that and to focus. And that's their service learning project. They connect it and many of them plan it out, whether it's making a, a speech or presentation to the guidance department about foster kids and why foster kids might need extra attention from guidance. Um, I had the young woman in 2018 who lost her grandfather in a bus crash. In December of 2018, he was a volunteer coach. And so her speech ended up being a, a presentation to our school board, but then she wrote to many of her elected officials in Springfield. She said, if we're on a school bus going over 30 miles per hour, we should have seatbelts, you know, in town, different, but on the highway. And so, and again, very heart wrenching. And then some do, you know, I want to raise the voting age, lower the voting age, whatever that might be. So um, we partnered with a group out of Chicago, Illinois called the Mikva Foundation. And they have a project soapbox. And so our kids get up on their soapbox and they have to film um, a speech. They're supposed to keep it under two minutes. It's supposed to be research based that talks through their cause and their solution. And, and it has to include a call to action. So they can record it. They can deliver it live. They can do whatever they want. That's where I first came into contact with green screens. And because many of them had green screens that made their <laughs> presentations even more powerful. So that's that service learning piece is them try. So most civics classes should be weaving that in right through the beginning. And those discussions can introduce them to topics. And then last but not least, simulations. Um, these are three that are very available to teachers, having a legislative hearing, having a town hall meeting, and then having a moot court, which again, they give arguments of contemporary. I need to update my court slide there. Um, <laughs> if you look at the, probably the most successful one uh, that I used a uh, town hall meeting was during the pandemic when students it was the 20, uh, 2020, 2021 school year where they were coming back in and they had to have bus, the masks to get on the bus and whatnot. And there was a large absentee rate my first hour class. And it was sophomores in US history and they were upset because they knew they had to have a mask, but many of them didn't have a mask at home. And so they couldn't get on the bus without that mask. And so they 
got on a Zoom with uh, Dana Brown, who was our like PR person threatening a walkout over the masks. She was really happy with me, um, but they thought it was very simple. And their solution was for they assigned a member of their class to get out of their eighth hour that had study hall and take a box of masks to the bus. So it's not just complaining, it's trying to find a solution because they were upset that their classmates were having to miss school because they didn't have buses or masks at home. So um, it was it was very simple, but they again had the superintendent on a Zoom talking to the superintendent about the need to, to make those um, provided. So, but that is the simulation. So. The mandates there, I want to give you some time. Oh, I did have, while we were doing this, though, um, we did see last fall, um, somebody did a simulation on slavery, and it was in Florissant, Missouri. The teacher tried to say it was a mandate, and that is not what we're talking about. So we are talking, again, about things that will help them learn about these democratic processes um, and and go from there. So. Let me pause and give you guys some questions. I have some uh, tons of other material there about um, what else is in there, about other mandates, about what the state says. Um, I can share with you whatever you think you would like. But Anne had told me about 50, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes for questions. And then believe yep. me, I can keep on going. So. All right. Uh, Tricia, did you have a question? Yeah, it. Um, you know, this sounds really good. How <laughs> much of it is actually <laughs> happening in the schools? Yeah, that's where the state comes in with the oversight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I can only speak to Unit 5, but in Unit 5, uh, we are fighting really hard. I'm still working with the current building chair to even get them to drop a traditional constitution test and instead have them do a moot court around a contemporary issue. And so they have to know all the laws and do all that and make it just as engaging. Um, most school districts, the only documentation they ask is for students to check that box or teachers to check that box once they've passed the constitution test. Um, I have a student teacher in District 87 and he's trying really hard and their CT is all about it. Um, trying to get the other things done, but it is self-reported. So somebody in a central office gets an email and they're supposed to check it off. Now I will tell you when you hear success stories though, students want this. We had a holdout in our high school and when they found out that others were getting to have dialogues and getting to have, you know, talking about the current cases that were in front of the court, the football, the praying football coach, who by the way, I just heard he resigned his job, but he that case, the kids were on fire. They they thought for sure, based on what they knew about First Amendment, that that and and it was it was really interesting. But the one gentleman who wasn't doing it was like, "Wait a minute, what's happening?" Because the kids are talking about this and wondering why we're not doing it. So, but unfortunately, yeah, we can't spy, make it happen. So this uh, is public schools only, right? Um, I would assume so. Um, it's a state requirement for high school graduation. So I would assume parochial schools are doing civics. They're teaching oh. civics. Um, probably checking the box on the constitution test as well. Oh. Now I do know celebrating peak in high school. I had a student teacher over there. They have a full day where their entire government civics classes do legislative hearings around an issue that the students have chosen. So it, it's coming up here in a couple of weeks. And so they get um, a lot of props. They kind of borrow the idea from West Chicago High School does it. And so it's something that kind of is catching on. So. Um, uh, ben, I think you had your hand raised. Yeah, um, at our last uh, coffee and conversation, we, we talked about uh, this a little bit and everybody seemed to have a different experience uh, from generation to generation. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the older folks uh, had uh, civics as part of uh, outside of school, uh, civic organizations, fraternal organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, it was expected to know this stuff outside of school anyways. But a lot of us uh, heading into the 90s, we, we still had uh, 
either a civics or a civics like class for a semester or two and the constitution test. And then after that, it, you know, the, the teachers in the room seemed to make it sound like it got a little sketchy, like uh, it's all focused on math and English and civics kind of, there's that requirement, the constitution test requirement, but it didn't sound like they were actually doing much actual civics teaching anymore. Do you know what happened since, you know, we graduated? Well, I do know that this mandate came back around in 2015 and in 2015 and, and actually right now at the, I was trying to get clarification from Professor Healy. He in January told us that there were only 39 states that had a civics mandate right now. So I think what ended up happening is just what you said, the emphasis on math, science, STEM, 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 right? And people started cutting it out. Like I, the school district I worked in, again, they pushed that constitution test into U.S. history. And said, well, when you're studying the colonies, et cetera, et cetera, go ahead and take care of that um, constitution test right there. And so in 2015 is when it was passed in the following school year, the students who graduated in 2016 on had to, to again, go back into that government class slash civics class. So um, Bloomington High School, I know, has always had a government class, but we, for the longest time, had our constitution test taken in. U.S. history their sophomore year. So when we brought this back, we argued quite a bit of time in Unit 5 about what grade level to put it at. Many wanted it freshman year. And to me, I'm like, they are so far from voting and so far from even driving and having an appreciation for the law that we push really hard for it to be junior year, although many of them take it senior year as well. Um, so yeah, that's my best guess is emphasis and money. We are not assessed on any common state test. Hmm. So when that movement and, um, I mean, the policies that mandated testing in every grade level, you know, the starting with no child left behind, it was probably the biggest one. We weren't on the test. We were on the Illinois state test. We used to be the very last test of day two of testing. And those worked real well. And then they finally dropped us off the test, which made us even less relevant. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, it really started elementary level, I think, and kind of trickled up because kids... I know my own two children in their elementary school, when there's no time for something, that was what was dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol, I think uh, you're next. Patrice, I was really excited to hear about the dialogue. Mm -hmm. that, and, and I assume you're talking at the high school level, right? Um, high school and middle school. Middle Probably school. Wanna, yeah, yeah. Middle school and even elementary. Some of the things that Mary Ellen Daniels has shared with me our middle school, they tend to be bigger group and or whole class projects around inquiry and around how can we solve this, but teaching them how to listen to one another. And, and the big thing that stuck was getting them to listen, to listen, not to respond. And so getting them to listen to one another, understand that. And then uh, I use something in my own classes and we've got, I, I saw it at the middle school, getting them to understand it's called frame, but understanding why that other person's perspective is so different. So bringing in that socio-emotional por portion of it, which is also another reason why they should be doing this. But middle school kids are very capable. Um, very. It's so capable. interesting because my question you just answered, my, Sorry. Question, <laughs> my you know, uh, continuing question was, do you feel like they're listening? And you are saying that they are listening to each other. Yeah. Um, let me let me show you what we tend to really promote. And in fact, Illinois State University is requiring an inquiry based where they have to know both sides. They have to be able to have a dialogue. If I took it out of here, I think I did. Um, have a dialogue around the topic of whatever. Um, so again, we started with, should we lower the voting age to 16. And my reasoning for that with my students and my civics was I said, hey, you guys know more than your parents. Let's be honest, right? It's, you know, and kind of joking around with them. And the students um, really started to respond and say, you know, we, we might. 
we might have more. And so they wanted to go survey their parents, which I was not going to be the brunt of that. <laughs> New to the community, but uh, yeah, no, thank you. But the students <laughs> at the end of it all, uh, and we started there with um, should we have voter ID? And it's a very simple, I'm going to show you this diagram here. Um, it's a very simple, yeah, share, um, academic kind of approach. And the kids start asking for this. So as you can see, they partner up and they get side A of an issue. So the two blue, and they talk it through and they have to summarize usually with junior high students or high lower level high school students, maybe you give them an article with three to four main points and you ask them to pick the two that they think are, have the, the most teeth to it or the strongest argument. And they share them in pairs. They have to really importantly, they have to repeat back those arguments so you can clarify. For example, in the voter ID one, they always talk about voter fraud, and yet in the study that was done after Indiana passed their voter ID law, um, even though the Supreme Court said it was relevant, found that in, in the cases of reported um, voter fraud at the federal level, an ID would not have prevented that. Mm -hmm. So the students are like, wait, what? And they have to back up and do that. And then when they're all done, they drop their roles. So they have usually a teacher in front of them. They drop their roles and they have to reach consensus. So, um, and, and what I'll do as a, a teacher is walk around and say, okay, wait, are you using your own arguments right now that we haven't had time to back up? Or are we using arguments from these sources? And I really emphasize to them, like, here are the sources. This is where this is coming from. You can check it if you want, you know, like trying to teach them again, media literacy is one of the mandates that we have to, to teach them. So trying to get them to vet the source and look at uh, where sources are coming from before they can use them. Or, and they'll even say sometimes, well, I found a source, I'm not sure it's as reliable that said this, how would I find that out? And so teaching them that skill to be better consumers of literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, Bonnie? I just based on the few slides you've shown, and I know this is what what you're doing in a program that you're familiar with and involved in. Um, I'm impressed with the use of critical thinking and critical problem solving tools. Mm -hmm. Those tools, just giving giving anybody, whether adults or teens, those tools, I have seen just works wonders, and I, I'm impressed when I saw root cause analysis, that's, yeah. you know, that's a great problem solving tool. So I, yeah. And I, I did not create it, but boy, am I a convert. And, and I go back to like Ben said, when he had to take the government class and memorize, I remember making charts, memorizing ages and numbers and trying <laughs> to just flash cards like crazy. But the first time one of my brother's classmates wanted to run for state representative, that's when that age became relevant. Right. He was like a 19 year old. And we're like, wait, why can't he run? He's more engaged than. And, and so for students to understand that that's really the kind of the tail that wags the dog when they see why this impacts them, then they have a need to want to know that, you know, mm -hmm. then they get an idea and, and that makes that instruction so relevant so they can understand, yeah. oh, I need to understand that why there's three branches you know, one of my students had done that. And again, I had no idea of the Dunlap, like what's it like here culturally, but they, somebody brought up a proposal about trimming the executive state. And so we talked about it. We looked at what the bureaucracy does. And I'm like, I'm the first one that pulls my hair out. Like it took three weeks for me to get a laptop because of bureaucracy. However, they know they've background checked me. They've done, you know, there's reasons for that. So it's just it's getting them to think about things. And they're not all interested in every little thing, but every one of my students found at least one thing that they were passionate about. And it helped that Dunlap passed a cell phone ban like in the last three days of the school. So they weren't going to be able to have cell phones this fall. So <laughs> yeah, that motivated them a little bit. <laughs> so you're doing this in normal, right? I, I was, yeah. And and actually I've been down to uh, the Charleston area. They have the big regional institutes. Um, I have been up in the Chicago area. 
Uh, my boss, Mary Ellen Daniels, has been to other states, um, even Florida, where <laughs> she's trying to get, I mean, they, she's not allowed, like I have a slide in here that talks about some of the things that why teachers would want to do this. It's part of their evaluation tool, but it also is so much socio-emotional when kids feel a sense of belonging and connection to that classroom, which goes back to the culture of the class and being able to have, I mean, we tell them it's safe, but it's not. I mean, you all have friends outside of this class. Everybody's going to repeat what you say. So please keep that filter on, but we're here to listen to one another and, and to try to process. Teachers buy into it. And so our last version of the current controversial issue discussion, which goes to that first prong, we had 22 teachers from, I think, six different states. So, and they take it and they learn about why, and they try to incorporate it into their own practice. So, but we've had thousands go through the badges. So doing that, it's free. And then they also get their CPDUs they need to recertify. And if they're a democracy school, they are eligible to earn a small, I think they get $250 if they complete it. Okay, so. but but here in Champaign Urbana, I mean, this is a state mandate, right? So this is happening yeah. in Champaign Urbana as well. It should be, yeah, yeah. Presumably in at, in social studies class. Yeah, the okay. civics class of some sort. Yeah, most the state of Illinois to be certified civics, I think it's political science. I think it's a total of like three hours or three classes that they've taken. Oh, that's it. So, yeah, to teach civics, and that's that's part of it as well. Um, I think that yeah. The, the state mandate is three hours of instruction for the no, 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 no. For the teacher three oh, courses okay. to certify them. But yeah, the, it is mostly taught in. I don't know about middle school because they can spread it out. So I would argue if you're talking about taking informed action, you might even see it in an English class where they're writing letters to elected officials on topics. So I don't know how they're supposed to track that. I've worked with the director of secondary ed here in unit five and talked, our teachers love it. Once they get kids engaged with good structure and the inquiry standards that are mandated as well, lend themselves to this, they're all about it. It's then it's, it's not a problem getting them to, to continue. So unless they get parents lose their mind. So, <laughs> but that's, if you start too big, if you start jumping in with who knows what, you know, the very first day, you know, and that's what scares me with some of my student teachers. That's, they feel like they can handle that easily. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. Do you know but what then, kind of guidelines that um, new civics teachers get whenever they start teaching? Because yeah. um, I'm from Muhammad and huh? there is, and I tutor. So yeah. I feel like I know um, like teacher by teacher what they kind of yeah. do. Yeah. So, um, I feel um, like there's a heavy differential between unbelievable. Each well, and here's why I'm going to share this and show you. And I, again, I am more than happy to send and my entire slide deck. It's not mine, it's compiled. So, if I look at this, this is, uh, where's Illinois? This is what's on the Illinois webpage right now. The 2022 states are down. So even if you try to go to them right now, you can't find them. Um, so the Illinois Civics Hub has, we've gone through the revisions ourselves and we've, as coaches, broke out, this is what was the 16, this is what's revised for civics. And this is free on our webpage. So I'm happy to send you that link too. But then you get into mandates for the state of Illinois. These are things you're supposed to be able to do. You have to be able to do. Um, and a lot of them, again, here's some of the all across. It starts in first grade civics, right? Why do we have rules? Why do we have responsibilities? Things like that. So that part is on is be a little bit. But again, currently down. Here's the one where your group becomes so valuable, right? Voter registration and how to register to vote is mandated now in a civics class. They have to teach them how to do that. So um, I, there's also federal curriculum that's out there that is free resources. This is one of the most interesting groups to me. It's bipartisan. The Heritage Foundation was part of this, as well as some of the most liberal think tanks, but it's all teacher generated lessons around these same topics. So um, all of that's at that Illinois Civics Hub and there's free resources, there's mandates, there's an audit you can take your own stuff through. 
um, my niece and nephew live in Muhammad Delaney. So one's in junior high. They're both in junior high, I think, eighth grade maybe and sixth grade. So, um, but yeah, it's, it is all over the place, even when you get a more stable curriculum, because even as you know, probably teachers' personalities, you know, when I was teaching summer school, there was one other civics teacher and I was like, come on, do you want to try this? Let's try it. Come watch my class. Like she was letting her kids out early. And she came in and she's like, I can't believe they're having this conversation about that. Those two kids hate each other. And I'm like, well, I don't know that. They don't know. I mean, I'm a foreigner. They, they've they agreed to put differences aside to be able to have a conversation. So um, I, I there are resources available and I'd be more than happy again to, I can drop my uh, email in the text here too, or Anne is welcome to hand that out. Um, and that's what we do is assist schools and um, we assist school districts. Um, I, again, first came down to Champaign with a rotary group to talk to them. I've worked with a couple of student teachers. I have two former teachers that are kind of in that area. I think, I think where Carter's at Lincoln high school. I've worked with a little bit. So yeah. And it's, it's free. It's free work because that's the McCormick Foundation pays us a very small stipend. But again, as I'm retired, I love it. Like I'm the one still attending all the administrator academies, trying to convince administrators they need to, to encourage their staff to do this, so. So um, also for the guidelines that I noticed, yeah. it's heavily discussion-based. Yep. Um, I can say from experience, sometimes it's better for direct instruction, especially mm -hmm. amendment based. Um, right. In my school district, it's like, if you have this teacher, you're only going to have to know one amendment. Um, yeah. If you have this teacher, you have to know all of the amendments. <laughs> so I feel like that's yeah. important to know because discussion wise, you're only in charge of one amendment and that's just yeah. not beneficial for anyone. Well, and in, in Yes and no. I agree. You should have exposure or at least know where to go as a student, right? I would guarantee you, though, if you had a topic that you were super interested in and it got you researching and forming an opinion, that depth of knowledge, when you fast forward to my age, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, can I re recall all those amendments that I memorized? I mean, again, I, I can picture the index cards that I was making to memorize for Mr. Gleick's social studies in Peoria so I could have them on my head. And then they were gone until I was teaching and having to dive back in and really get into it. So I 100% agree with you. If you have a test that's asking you to memorize those, but that's boring. <laughs> that's, I, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm curious whether most high schools in Illinois have a senior trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, we did not. I know our eighth graders went. Um, yeah, I took students probably one of the greatest things I've done was 2016 and 2020 in January, I took students to Iowa for pre-caucus weekend mm -hmm. and saw students really get engaged and they did what they were comfortable with. And we did group signups and things. And um, the amount of heat and anxiety and pressure that we got because of that was unbelievable. And it, some was, how come you aren't taking more kids? But some was, why didn't you go see, like in 2016, we had no incumbent. So both parties were there times 10. And so kids signed up. And if three or more of them wanted to go to an office, we went to an office and they met, you know, they were in Ted Cruz's office. We missed him, but they met Chris Christie. They met Bill Clinton. They met Chelsea Clinton. They all loved the Bernie at that time. They were in Bernie's office. He wasn't there. <laughs> um, but in 2020, there were no Republicans in Iowa, I mean, campaigning. And so people were like, why are you not meeting? And we're like, so we let the kids handle it. And they were, you know, well, if you would study, there's no caucus for Republicans. So the only people, you know, it was kind of interesting, but, um, but I used to take the eighth graders out there in Washington, DC. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I think even pre COVID it started shrinking. Parents just did it or kids or activities. I mean, Delaney, why do you think would students go on a school trip to the nation's capital? What do you think? Um, so in Muhammad, we also do an eighth grade year. Um, yeah. I'm 
gonna major in political science and I there wasn't go. gonna go because it was a thousand dollars to go uh-huh. that was the problem for a lot of students yeah um the monetary it just wasn't there for a lot of them yeah. who were interested in going and a lot of the students were like why would I go for a thousand dollars when I could go to Florida for a thousand dollars so exactly exactly let me share one last thing here real quick on my screen um share um we and normal something I started doing come on it's not there you go. Um, we've created this, this woman right here is uh, Kimberly Harris, and she's a town council woman. This is our mayor, and this is another town council person. And they were at the IML something convention, a lobby day down in Springfield. And so these were the small group of our youth on a mission students that were able to miss school to go. Paige Malloy is a uh, poli sci major, Delaney, and myself peeking in the back corner. But we went down to the Capitol and in Springfield and made some pretty cool connections. We had arranged to meet with our state representative, Sharon Chung, as well as our state senator, Dave Kaler. Um, This young lady in the blue green is the one that authored some bill with these two about, I don't know, parents who put their kids on YouTube. Delaney, do anything about that? And they make money. They're like influencers and they post their kids all the time and there's now a state law that they cannot profit from that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was a big that. like drama where children who were like the stars and were making yep. money, their money, yes. their parents were getting all the money. Yeah, and so they kind of these two, Sharon Chung and Dave Kaler, have sponsored state legislation. Um, we managed to meet the Secretary of State very briefly, but the Lieutenant Governor actually invited them into her inner office and was talking to them about local issues. They had. Um, two different presentations that they worked on that they presented to the town council um, throughout the semester. So they just picked projects for this year, this past weekend, we had a lock-in, lock-in. So um, they were there for really three straight days. It seemed like Friday night, all day Saturday and Sunday. Um, And it really is engaging. Um, And so that is something I would say that at the community level, I think is even probably more powerful than a trip to DC, um, especially with security. And, mm-hmm. you know, I loved it, but I would, I would not have been able to go as a student myself, but I went as a chaperone. So Delaney, there's your two cents, go as a chaperone. Cause it's free <laughs> and they even give you some meal money there. So, <laughs> but it's exhausting cause you can't sleep. Cause those little eighth graders, you gotta they <laughs> hate them in their rooms and yeah. 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 Well, <clears throat> Our time is almost up. Yes. Um, it's been really um, an interesting discussion. I'm so glad that we had this. And Tracy, we want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and uh, answering questions. And if you would send us your slide deck, Absolutely. I, will, I will distribute that to anyone who asks me for it. Um, just so, please know I'm a school teacher who's not sure where things are going. So there's all kinds of stuff in there. <laughs> it's color coded. Yeah. It's hyperlinked, but absolutely. I'd be happy to share that with you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Um, when uh, your group, I feel very strongly about the work that you all do. And I know you have gotten your share of bad press on uh, maybe not in Illinois yet, but other groups <laughs> come in and, uh, you meet a mandate for those teachers. So please reach out and help them and and advocate for the students because you're doing something that allows the very minimum, you know, the Annenberg Foundation citizenship is your highest calling is what they say. So um, keep doing what you do. And if I can be of any other resource to you or help or assistance or Delaney, keep in touch, go poli sci. So, <laughs> that's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a student teacher down there from ISU, but I think they switched him to Hayworth. So he was supposed to be a Muhammad and they switched him to Hayworth. So I don't know why. So yeah. good school district though. So thank yeah. you all. Thank you thank for you. giving me your time. And if I didn't answer something, please don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, we got your number now. 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I will not voice text Anne when I, I respond. No more no, stats no. or reference. <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe when you're gone here, I'll share that with everyone. Oh, no. That one was PG compared to what I said to Rotary. So, yeah. I said, <laughs> yeah. I need to enunciate a little more if I prep. Yeah. So, very yeah. nice to meet you all. Please don't hesitate. And Anne, I will send you that. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh -huh. Have a good evening. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.